Science Unwrapped. Uh, I'm Nancy Huntley from the Science Unwrapped team, and I'm here to introduce our speaker tonight and tell you a little bit about how Science Unwrapped works. Um, is there anyone here who hasn't been in a long time or was here for the first time at Science Unwrapped? Great, terrific. Well, I'll tell you first just a little bit about how it works. So at Science Unwrapped, we allow about an hour for a presentation. And so our speaker tonight, Dr. Rain Wurzbaugh, uh, will talk for about 45 minutes, and then we'll have 10 minutes, maybe 15 minutes for questions. So when he stops talking, we're not quite done with the inside part of the program yet. If you have to leave, please leave quietly and without talking so that other people can stay and ask questions and hear the answers. Uh, Wayne knows a lot about the Great Salt Lake, and I'm sure you'll have questions for him at the end. And then at 8 o'clock, uh, we'll adjourn and send you all out into, into the hallways. We have some refreshments, and we also have lots and lots of cool, interesting, fun, sciencey kind of stuff for you to look at and play around with. So there's lots of material, material on the Great Salt Lake. There's lots on water. There's some on plants and animals. There's some on cool physics. Build your own race car, the perfect thing for the Bonneville Salt Flats. So I hope you will enjoy yourself and uh, learn a lot here. So I'll, I'll introduce Wayne now. Our speaker is Dr. Wayne Wurzbaugh. He's in the Department of Watershed Sciences here in the Ecology Center. Uh, Wayne's background is in, uh, initially was in fisheries. In college, he majored in fisheries at U University of California, Davis. And then he did a graduate degree in fisheries also at Oregon State University and served in the Peace Corps. And after that, he did his PhD research in the ecology of lakes, which is what he'll be talking about to you tonight. But he still works with fisheries as well as with lakes. Uh, in addition to the Great Salt Lake, Wayne has worked in many other regional lakes. He's studied Bear Lake a lot. Uh, he's studied Stanley, the Stanley Basin Lakes, the beautiful Redfish Lake. And he's also studied big salty lakes and high elevation lakes in other parts of the world, in South America and in Europe. Uh, in addition to loving lakes and knowing a lot about them, uh, Wayne is also an avid outdoorsman. He hunts, he hikes, he fishes, he rafts, um, all with a lot of passion. He skis, and he's an excellent photographer, so I think we'll see some pretty remarkable photographs of lakes and the creatures who live in them. So, Wayne Ritzbach. Thank you, Nancy. Uh, and thank all of you for coming out on a cold winter night um, and not taking off for the three-day weekend. I was a little worried. Maybe everybody had headed to southern Utah. Uh, as Nancy said, I, I went to the University of California at Davis. And when I went there uh, back in the late 60s, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. But I'd grown up fishing in the Sierra Nevada mountains. and. It was a time science was on the rise with the launch of the first Sputnik satellite. And so I was kind of had outdoor stuff and science in my blood, but I re really didn't know what I wanted to do. And so I went off and I was in a dormitory um, as a freshman. And the dorm advisor, a guy named Mike Swift, said, got to know me a little bit. And he said, yeah, you know, you might like this limnology course. And I said, limnology? And so yeah, take it. So I, I took it as a sophomore, and um, I did well in it. And the professor hired me for a job uh, that summer, and I did that for a couple summers. And that was really kind of the start of my career. I was just a little bit happenstance knowing this guy, Mike Swift, but I had the inclination, uh, I guess, for this sort of thing. The other thing that happened in that class is I met this lady. Uh, who, if you're associated with Edith Bowen Lab School, school knows she was uh, taught there forever and ever. And she was also in the class, and we went, this is that shot at the top is her catching her fish, first fish on our winter field trip to Castle Lake in Northern California. And we've been together ever since. So thank you very much, Linda. <laughs> So I called myself for this presentation anyway, a limnologist at large. And Nancy kind of spilled the beans, but who, who in the audience knows what a limnologist is? Raise your hand. Oh, much better than average audience, okay? Very knowledgeable audience. So limnologist is the study of inland waters generally described, or more specifically, usually working with lakes. 
And limnologists feel kind of downtrodden because everybody knows what an oceanographer is. Nobody knows what a limnologist is. <laughs> so we're really sad. So don't forget that word. Help me out. Uh, and I started out uh, doing work uh, on my PhD in limnology at Clear Lake in Northern California. Uh, went off to the Peace Corps with, with Linda and worked at Lake Titicaca up at 12,800 feet on lake, large lake between uh, Peru and Bolivia. Uh, got the job here in 1983, so I've been around a long time. A lot of my early work was on the fisheries and the limnology, you know that word now, the knowledge of, of, of Bear Lake. Uh, we also, with Chris Lukey, Pedro Booty, and a number of other people, Michelle Baker, worked up in the Sawtooth Mountains. This is a picture of, of Redfish Lake, although we worked on a lot of them up there. Uh, a couple of years ago, I went down and worked on a lake very similar to the Great Salt Lake called Mar Chiquita in northern Ar Argentina. In fact, we have birds that fly from here directly to Mar, Ch Mar Chiquita, phalaropes. So we're kind of linked together with that, with that lake. They have flamingos, we don't. Right, and then I've done a whole lot of work for about 30 years on and off, and, and a lot more in recent years, on the Great Salt Lake. And so that's what we're going to be talking about today. This is what I said to us limnologists feel trod upon, and nobody knows who we were. So I made bumper stickers, and I've sold about 3,000 of these. <laughs> to try and promote the field. And so we're making small inroads, but I think the oceanographers still have, have, it, have us beat. But if you see my truck, actually it's a white version of that now. If you see the truck, you might want to stop me, maybe give me a hug, and uh, <laughs> we'll uh, take it from there. All right, before I launch into my, my talk, I want to talk a little bit about science uh, and, and kind of my view of it. So, a lot of you, maybe when you think of science as this stodgy old field, you're down in the lab, you're not, you know, you're, you're learning calculus or you're, uh, you know, learning the taxonomy of this group or that group. And there is a, there's a lot of detail and a lot of things you need to learn, but I like to think of, of, of limnolo or limnology, science, and uh, the arts, in this case music, uh, as relatively similar. So doing research is similar to being a musician. In both endeavors, you have to go through the toil of developing your skills and techniques, right? Learning your finger picking if you're a musician or learning the taxonomy of copepods or whatever it is. But the real joy stems from generating an exciting discovery or a beautiful, intriguing song or maybe music, right? So I think, you know, Science is a field of creativity, and, and that's the most fun part for me. Although I don't mind get, getting out there in the field as well. There's a lot of people to thank, and they wouldn't all fit on the slide, but uh, Amy Marcarelli, Eric McCulley, Beth Ogata, some graduate students that work with me, some undergraduates that have done and research and published that work, a uh, number of international collaborators and postdocs, some technicians that would definitely won't all fit on there, and funding mostly from state agencies, also from College of Natural Resources, before where it came the Quinney College of Natural Resources, and some foundations. So thanks to all those people and many more that, that helped me out along the way. All right, Great Salt Lake. Probably many of you, at least those of you who are raised in Utah, I uh, have seen maybe pictures like this and know a, a bit about it, but we want to get a little bit of background. Uh, but um, the Great Salt Lake is a closed basin lake, and we'll come back and talk about that a little bit later. That's a remnant of Lake Bonneville that, that existed up to about 15,000 years ago. And you can see how huge and extensive Lake Bonneville was. It's 330 miles long. Now it's a mere 75 miles long by comparison. Uh, it was about uh, 900, uh, 950 feet deep, close to 1,000 feet deep. Now it's only 35 feet deep. And it was entirely fresh water and had a lot of fish, pretty much the same fish that we have in Bear Lake now, but we're in Lake Bonneville. Now it's what we call hypersaline. It's too salty. Most parts of it are too salty for fish. And so uh, we don't have fish, and we don't have a lot of the organisms that exist in those, in those fresh waters. 
give you a perspective on size, I spent some time in Switzerland a few years back. There's Switzerland they overlaid on that. Lake Bonneville was much bigger than Switzerland. And uh, Great Salt Lake kind of gives it a run for money, at least from the vertical dimensions on, on, it, on it. Here's another you know, kind of alarming perspective. So here's a little busy slide, but here's our mountains. And as Lake Bonneville went up and down, it would equilibrate de depending on the climatic conditions at certain levels. And the water and the waves would come pounding in. And so we built these different beaches. And we're sitting on one of these from the Provo Lake level when the lake was at an elevation of 4,860 feet. But at its highest, it was way up at 5,085 feet. And now, the lake's down here, not just a little bit below the, the airport, and the current level is 4,200 feet. So we've, we've uh, lost about 850 feet. And if the lake sees fit to uh, rise back up again, all, right, all of our structures, the temple, the legislators, and so forth, are all going to be, <laughs> all going to be flooded out. If we're lucky and it just rises to here, we'll all have beachfront property. So uh, that might take a while. I, I don't, don't, don't invest now. I would wait on that. All right. OK, some Great Salt Lake superlatives, OK? It's the largest uh, US lake west of the Mississippi River, the second largest lake in the United States, if you don't count the Great Lakes. We, do, we don't care about the Great Lakes. All right. It's the fourth largest terminal or uh, no outlet lake in the world, OK? So there's bigger ones, but we're big. It's one of the largest migratory bird magnets in the western North America. And it's been, de because of that, a, a designated a western hemispheric shorebird reserve. So we have thousands or millions of birds that migrate through and utilize the resources of the Great Salt Lake. So it's incredibly important for the birds, incredibly nice for us, those of us that are bird watchers. It's the world's largest producer of brine shrimp cysts for aquaculture. The resting eggs that the shrimp produce are used in aquaculture. We'll talk quite a bit about that. On the downside, it among has among the highest recorded levels of the toxin methylmercury that in, in North America, really, or in the United States. So we have some, quite a lot of mercury hanging out in there, and we're somewhat concerned about that. And we also have the Great Salt Lake, or at least Farmington Bay, one of the large bays of the lake, is the most polluted uh, lake in Utah. So lots of suburb leaves, most of them good, a few of them not so good. All right, so why is the Great Salt Lake salty and many, many lakes, or most lakes, are fresh? All right. Well, with the Great Salt Lake, as I said, it's a closed basin lake. That is, it has no outlet to the sea. All right, so no river outflow. So what we have is, oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. You might get out on time if I do that. <laughs> All right, uh, so with a, a, a closed basin lake, what we have is our mountains and the snow comes and we have fresh waters that melt. And you have this process called weathering of the soils and the underlying rocks that yield small amounts of salt. All right, so the Logan River has very small amounts of salt in it, and it flows down into the water and into the lake. But with a closed basin lake, the only way the water leaves is by evaporation. So the water goes out, and it leaves the salt lake salts behind. So over the thousands and tens of thousands of years, all of these salts that have weathered and come out of the <laughs> geological substrates get stuck down here in, in the, bottom of the bottom of the basin, in the closed basin. So in contrast, if you have an open basin lake with an outlet that goes to the sea or just goes somewhere, so Bear Lake actually is like this, its salts go, come in just the same way. You have some evaporation, but most of the water leaves via the river carrying the salts along with it. So with Bear Lake, for example, those salts go down and go into the Great Salt Lake. Right? Most lakes, you would go down and they'd go out into the ocean, and voila, uh, we have this one big lake we call the Pacific Ocean. It's salty, okay? So all the weathering products have come out of, out of the environment. So that's why the Great Salt Lake's salty. 
So how unusual is this lake? So quiz, quiz time. He didn't know you probably had to take a quiz. I'm not going to grade you on it, but what portion of the volume of the world's inland waters are saline? How many think zero to two percent? Hands up. Okay. Two to ten percent. All right. Ten to twenty. Twenty to forty. Greater than forty. All right. All those that have their hands up right now win. All right. So more, more than 40% of the inland water uh, in lakes is salty. All right. A lot of those bodies of water, we sometimes, because they're big and because they're salty, we call them seas. So the Caspian Sea, the Salton Sea in Southern California. All right. So there's some big ones around, but part of the problem in our perception of this is that a lot of the big salt lakes are in Central Asia. All right. Kazakhstan, Iran, uh, uh, China has a lot of big salt lakes. Uh, Australia has a lot of large salt lakes. So they're not that unusual. We tend to think of them as unusual, but they're not, and they're important. And I uh, hope, hope to convince you some of the importance of some of these. OK, the Great Salt Lake today. We don't have Lake Bonneville anymore. We've got a lake that looks like this. And it's about 83 miles long, or 437,000 feet, or 133 kilometers. Area 1,700 square miles, or 4,300 square kilometers. And the depth, as we said earlier, about 35 feet, or, or 16 meters. So think about that. It's 40, 437 feet, 1,000 feet long, and only 35 feet deep. So we've got this little skiff of water relative to the size of the lake, and it's not, not deep at all, all right? We've done some things to the lake. One of the, the biggest thing we've probably done to it is put causeways across it. So here's the railway causeway. It starts here in the mainland here, goes across to Promontory Point, and then over to the West Desert. And this was built to carry train traffic. So they didn't have to go up and around the lake, a shortcut. So we'll divide the lake in half. We put in some culverts and breaches, and we have some exchange of water between the two basins. All right. We've also put in a cause, automobile causeway out to Antelope Island. Hopefully, a lot of you have been on that causeway going, going out to visit Antelope Island. All right. So there's our train coming across the tracks. And so we've divided the, the lake up into four lakes, really. So we have Gilbert Bay, in, or sometimes I, we might call it the south arm. We have Gunnison Bay in the north, or the north arm. And Bear River Bay, uh, one that's closest to us. And then in the, the south, down by Salt Lake City, we have Farmington Bay. Right? And these are all pretty different ecosystems. And one of the main reasons they're different is that our rivers come in over here. So we have the Bear River flows down into, surprisingly, Bear River Bay. We have the Jordan River goes down into Farmington Bay and the Weber out in the center there. But the thing you note in, is that all of this fresh water, there's no rivers coming in up here. So all of this fresh water comes in and can make Farmington Bay and Bear River Bay relatively fresh. Right? And so if we look at the salinities on those, or how much salt, how many grams of salt per liter of water, Bear River Bay can be as low as one gram per liter during spring runoff where you're flushing, flushing things down. Likewise, Farmington Bay can be that low. When the rivers stop, or when the river water, more specifically, is diverted and not, you don't have much water reaching the lake, then you get this interchange from out of Gilbert Bay, moves back in. And the salinities can go up pretty high. But in general, they're moderate salinities. And I referred to these somewhat inappropriately, but as estuaries, like you might have on, in the coastal United States, where you have fresh waters coming down to meet the ocean. Here we have our fresh waters coming, intermediate salinity levels. Right. Gilbert Bay fluctuates around 
uh, depending on if we're in a drought or in a wet cycle, but it's about 160 grams per liter, right? You can compare that to the ocean salinity here, 35 grams per liter. So we're, Gilbert Bay is maybe five times saltier than the ocean. And then Gunnison Bay, Gunnison Bay essentially it has some rainwater that falls on it, tiny amounts of springs, but nothing really. So it's getting this 160 gram per liter salty water, flows in here, and then it evaporates, right? Evaporation water goes up, the salts are left behind, and Gunnison Bay is at what we call saturation. It's holding as much salt as it can. And when, when you have evaporation in the, in the summer, well, anytime you have it, those salt crystals form and they fall to the surface. I was out there a few months ago on a hot summer day, and you could see the salt crystals forming on the surface of the lake because it, you know, it was 90, 100 degrees, and then a little turbulence would come along and they would float down like this to, to the bottom of the lake. It was pretty cool. So very different ecosystems in these different salinity systems. We can, we'll look a little bit at kind of the ecology and the biota that develops in those. The other thing we've done is put close to a couple million people around the shores of the lake, right? So we have industry, we have sewage treatment plants, all sorts of things, and we, those all create waste products. And a lot of those come down and influence the lake, particularly Farmington Bay here, but also Gilbert Bay. And we'll look a little bit at that, all right? So it's a little bit unusual for most salt lakes being in arid areas often don't have big populations around them. But because we have the Wasatch Mountains, irrigation systems, and so forth, we have a lot of people on the shores of the Great Salt Lake. Great Salt Lake's worth a whole bunch, right? So not too long ago, in 2012, Bioeconomics published this report on uh, the economic effect in millions of dollars, these values here. Uh, and they all add up to uh, 1,300 million or $1.3 billion. The biggest chunk of that is for mining and industrial. So we produce a lot of magnesium. We produce potash fertilizer, titanium. Uh, they included waste disposal, the cost of allowing us to dump our waste, un not so much treated, into the Great Salt Lake, and we might have to treat them otherwise. I wasn't real happy with that uh, utilization. Uh, but a lot of important things, and this comes from the salts in the lake. Okay, so we have salt ponds, we evaporate them, and then scoop things up and make it into magnesium metal or potash fertilizer. It's also incredibly important for recreation, hunting, bird watching, boating, you could probably add some other, other things to that list. And then it's important for aquaculture, not probably what you normally think of as aquaculture, which you normally is thinking about fish, but here uh, the industry is harvesting the cysts, have a bunch in this can here, the resting eggs of the brine shrimp that are sold to the aquaculture industry, right? So that's $57 million, roughly, as important to the economy of this state. We'll come back to some of these things here. Because of all the salt in the water, it's kind of a hard place to live for a lot of organisms. And talk like this wouldn't be right without a Gary Larson cartoon. So this is slug vacation disasters. Hey, everyone, time for a swim, you know, the Great Salt Lake. Well, the slugs aren't going to do too well. So there's a lot of organisms, right, that do well in fresh water but don't do so well in salt water. So we've got a kind of a limited cast of characters in these systems. Take you on a little tour of some parts of the lake. This is uh, Gunnison Bay, our, our north arm. We were out there a number of years ago. It was really windy in the morning, and it created all this foam on the lake. And then it died down and had these spectacular patterns on it. And the water up there is red uh, because of the uh, microbial life that lives in there. And we have somebody coming uh, in oh, two or three months, uh, Dr. Bonnie Baxter from Westminster College, and she's done a lot of work on those organisms, so I'm not going to talk a lot about them, but they're spectacular 
red. And those, you probably, many of you, if you've flown over it, you've seen that the North Arm Great Salt Lake is red. We also have Gunnison Island out, uh, uh, tucked out into the lake. And uh, we've gone out there and worked. Uh, another thing, at least we have some remnants of something called stromatolites, or we call them also biostromes. And these are, this is rock that forms or grows in the lake. All right? And it grows because, much like a reef, coral reef might grow, it grows because you have algae, these microscopic plants, on the surface of the rocks. And they change the chemistry, and they call, cause limestone to precipitate and build up layers of a rock. So we had pulled our boat. Actually, we had run our boat into the reef. Uh, I pulled up sounds better, I guess. Uh, and we got out, and I uh, brought out about a, ch a chunk of uh, stromatolite and look, looked at it there. All right, Gunnison Island that I mentioned lies way over here. And I went out not too, last summer, that day I mentioned when the salt crystals were precipitating on the surface of the lake and then sinking, to do some bird banding with the Division of Wildlife Resources. Uh, so we used a corral and um, herded things. Uh, and then we grabbed the, the chicks, they're pretty big, um, and uh, put, uh, put bands on them so they could track them to see what other parts of uh, Utah or else, where else they're, they're migrating to. As I said earlier, uh, it's really a magnet for birds. Here's an uh, American coot. These are some tundra swans on the Bear River Refuge. And we have uh, over 2.5 million birds migrate through and use the, bird, uh, the Great Salt Lake and the associated wetlands. Right? So it's extremely important. There's a lot of food for them. Some birds come in and stay for a, a month or two and double their weight. Right. Others come, come and raise their chicks and, and get the brine shrimp and something called brine flies and feed them to the young. And here's some of the shorebirds, uh, some beautiful pictures by Judd Patterson of, of uh, American avocet in the upper left, a snowy plover that nests here, and the marble godwit. And we also have fish eating birds. Oh, fish, why, why would we have fish? Well, in Bear River Bay and Bear River Refuge and other places, we do have fish. So we have pelicans and egrets, right, that uh, utilize the Great Salt Lake. And here's one of the fish that lives in the Great Salt Lake, but this is in the, uh, one of the freshwater bays of the, the northeastern part of Bear River Bay where you have a lot of, um, of river water coming in. And this was an undergraduate that was, did a research project. As far as we know, the fish, first fishery study of the Great Salt Lake. And we caught that in a, in a gill net out there. And then there's Farmington Bay. Farmington Bay hosts a lot of birds, so it's really important that way. But it also has huge algal blooms, right? And I said earlier, we have those couple million people on the shores. Half of the water flowing into Farmington Bay is from secondary treated sewage water. So secondary treated sewage water takes the bacteria out. It's not, uh, there's no pathogens that'll make you sick necessarily, but the nutrients are left in that water. And so when you have a lot of nutrients, this is a lot of sunlight, this is a shallow bay, you grow a lot of algae. And in this case, this type of algae is called cyanobacteria. Uh, and, and it had built up in a scum. It usually doesn't have these scums on the surface, but there's always huge amounts of, of uh, algae in the water. And then sometimes uh, they, they accumulate at the surface. And that's a bad thing to have that many uh, cyanobacteria because they produce toxins, something called nodularin. Gram for gram, it's about as toxic as cobra venom, all right? Fortunately, cyanobacteria don't have fangs, and we don't go down and drink water out of Farmington Bay, so it's hard to get it into our bodies, fortunately. But if you do, it, uh, it's pretty bad stuff. And you have these blooms of these cyanobacteria in fresh waters as well when you have high nutrient levels. And it's common for cattle and dogs and so forth to die from drinking, drinking that water. 
Here's some levels for three different years where we measured the toxin uh, levels in uh, Bear River Bay in the pink, Gilbert Bay, this red cross, and then in Farmington Bay in the greenish symbol. And Bear River Bay and Gilbert Bay have sort of negligible quantities of these cyanotoxins, they're called. But you can see when the cyanobacteria bloom in the spring and into June, we can have really high concentrations. So this one goes up over 663. So what, are, what kind of levels, you know, those numbers certainly don't mean anything to you unless you've uh, happened to study cyanotoxins. But if you put on the World Health Organization's moderate risk for human health, this is for contact recreation, it's about uh, 20 micro, our units here are micrograms per liter of concentration of these toxins in the water. So it's down at 20. And so you can see that we're frequently above that and sometimes well, well above the 20. All right, so don't go swim. Don't go swimming there. And there's uh, no swimming signs posted. The United States uh, has a goal of having uh, fish, uh, fishable and swimmable waters. Well, this isn't one of them. It's not too healthy to swim there. But it also could maybe uh, a problem for the, uh, bird life that utilize it. So this is uh, a, a national park in Spain and they had waterfowl mortalities. In this case, it was flamingos, and this dotted line shows the concentration of cyanotoxins they had there. And again, well, well below what we're seeing in the Great Salt Lake. So we've got a problem with the excess nutrients. The excess nutrients cause this process, maybe you've heard the term eutrophication, making the water body more productive. And we've done that in Farmington Bay and Spades. All right, Gilbert Bay. Most of the rest of what I'm going to talk about today is in Gilbert Bay. Uh, myself, uh, I, I've done a lot of work in Farmington Bay in particular uh, and, and in Gilbert Bay. And, and a lot of research by others on the lake has focused on, on Gilbert Bay because it's the largest bay and it also harbors some organisms that uh, we're interested in. So this is kind of a very simple view of the, of, of the food web in Gilbert Bay. You have nutrients, this would be nitrogen, phosphorus, the same sorts of things you'd put on your lawns, same things we have too much of in, in Farmington Bay. And you mix of that nutrients and light, and then you have these phytoplankton, microscopic plants. This one's about four microns long. Right? You need a microscope to see them, but they're what turn the water green. Those grow and reproduce, and they're fed upon by our friend the brine shrimp here. These guys are about, oh, a centimeter long when they're adults, right? The brine shrimp then are fed upon by a variety of different birds, right? So that's what we call the pelagic food web up here. That's out in the open waters of the lake. But we have another food web that's referred to as the benthic, from the benthic zone or the bottom of the lake, where uh, you have algae now growing on the bottom. This is called periphyton. If you were wading in the Logan River and you saw the green stuff on the rock, that, that's periphyton. So it uses the nutrients and light. And then that's fed upon primarily by brine fly larvae. And these are also about a centimeter long, something like that, quarter of an inch. And they're fed on by shorebirds, grebes, ducks, a whole variety of birds. So these brine fly larvae and sometimes the adults and the brine shrimp are incredibly productive in the lake and hence really important for the uh, birds that utilize the lake. So here's kind of a blown up view. Here's our brine shrimp. These are filtering limbs and they beat these in the water and filter out those microscopic algae. Right? This is a female. We can tell because she has this egg sac down here and she's going to produce a lot of young. In this case, one this big, she might produce 100 or so uh, eggs or, or, or cysts. Here's our brine fly larvae. Not very charismatic exactly, but nutritious if you're a bird. You like it a lot. These brine flies grow primarily on these stromatolites that I mentioned earlier. Right? Another word for those are biostromes. And these are the rocks that are growing in the lake. Uh, this is off the uh, west coast, west shore of Antelope Island, and the lake's at really low levels here, 
So some of these are exposed. But beyond this, there's others. And you would have those, the periphyton, that green algae growing on the bottom, and brine flies uh, gr growing on it as well. Uh, to sample these, we put on scuba gear and dive down. We utilize this bucket, scrub, scrub the organisms off, pump them up to the boat, and then analyze them, count them, uh, measure their size, do nutritional analyses on them. The brine flies, here's a brine fly, this little white thing here, this little white thing, and then they're feeding on this algae on the biostrome or the uh, stromatolite. And then they pupate, okay, just like a butterfly uh, forms a chrysalis. These form pupae. Uh, they mature, the adults mature in there. This little stalk breaks off, they float to the surface, and voila, you have brine flies at the surface. And this gull is really happy about all those brine flies uh, that are on the shore of the lake. There, those of you who have visited the lake in midsummer know what we're talking about. They're ex incredibly uh, abundant. Fortunately, they don't bite, so that's a nice thing about it. Uh, but they're another a good uh, source of food. Other birds will dive down and feed on the, on the larvae underwater. All right, so the brine, brine shrimp, okay? So how many brine shrimp are there in the Great Salt Lake? I hadn't done this calculation until I was getting ready for this talk, but I thought maybe it'd be an interesting figure. So when we go out, we pull these nets like this. This is called a zooplankton net. We pull it vertically up through the water. We can figure out how much water we filtered, and then we count the number of brine shrimp that we catch. We go back to the lab, put it under a microscope, and do some analyses on it. Right? And in midsummer, in the Great Salt Lake, we have about three of these per liter. Right? And so here's a liter. Right? My water bottle, if I run out of it saliva at the night, all right? So if we multiply, we've got three brine shrimp per liter times the number of liters in the Great Salt Lake, uh, just a mere 10 trillion liters of water in the Great Salt Lake, and you multiply that out, and we have 30 trillion brine shrimp, plus or minus a few billion here and there, right? <laughs> well, that's a lot, particularly. Uh, particularly if the population of Utah is about three million people, so each of you, by being members of the state, have, have, have maybe have claim to about 10 million uh, shrimp per person. That's a lot of shrimp. That's a lot of shrimp. All right, here's the life cycle of the brine shrimp. All right, so we've been looking at a picture more or less like this adult female. There's males that use these claspers up on their head to uh, uh, join up with the females and they mate, and they, then they produce eggs. But two things can happen. If conditions are good, if the temperatures are right and it's long, sunny days, enough food around for uh, the young, the female will take that as, as cues and they produce eggs that, and give birth to live young. And these are called nop nopuli. Right? They're about a millimeter long, right? and they grow, and they go through various stages. They get bigger and bigger and grow into a subadult, uh, and then eventually, and not eventually, in two or three weeks, they can grow into an adult. So it can be a pretty short life cycle. Right? And then they produce some more eggs. But when times are tough, it's getting cold, short days, maybe not much food in the water column, the female switches its reproductive mechanism and produces these resting eggs that we call cysts. And these are pretty amazing, pretty amazing things. They're extremely durable, as we'll see, and can hang around for years or even decades. And in the Great Salt Lake, these will float around on the surface or maybe get washed up on the shore. And then the following spring, when you have fresh water run into the lake and it reduces the salinity in the surface layer or around the shore, that's a cue for the brine shrimp to hatch, and then so the juveniles hatch out and then start the cycle over again. And we could do a little... I've got a few of my pets from the lab. Come on, warm up.
So this, I, I didn't count them. I one, two, three, four, five. There's about six uh, in there, and you, most of them are females, but we have two males that are, are mating and gra grasping on. No, three, I guess. Um, uh, males that are linked up with the females and, and, and mating. Right? And you can see at the, at the back that, that egg sac is greenish in this case. Right? So you can see they're swimming a little fast, and it's hard if you've got the lighting just right, and I don't have it just right. You could see, let me try one more thing here. I don't know if this will be any better or worse. So you can see those legs beating, and those that help them, that's what they use to swim, but they also beat and they filter out the algae out of the water, so they get their nutrition from those microscopic, microscopic plants. All right, and uh, for all the kids in the audience or those of you that feel like your kids, uh, we have some uh, kits that we made up. So you can make up little uh, microcosms of the Great Salt Lake. So we have our phytoplankton, our algae, and we have little hatching flasks and little uh, bottles of cysts. This, and I took those bottles out of this can of cysts that I bought about six years ago and have stored in my freezer. And I, I don't know, there's probably a billion the brine shrimp cysts and eggs in here. And they're dry, and we just put them in the freezer, and then when you want to hatch them, if you want to do that in, in your kit, you can do that. But be careful, sometimes if you feed them too much, uh, they will get, get out and get out of control. <laughs> All right, so these brine shrimp and other aspects of the Great Salt Lake make for great teaching opportunities. So uh, Linda, for example, has taken for a number of years when she was teaching there, would take her kids down in the spring uh, to Bridger Bay and uh, uh, talk about the Great Salt Lake, its value, talk about the brine shrimp and so forth. And the Friends of Great Salt Lake, an uh, environmental group centered down in Salt Lake City, uh, has, takes uh, lots and lots of school, uh, school groups out, uh, again, primarily to Bridger Bay. And, and studies things. And Friends of Great Salt Lake is here tonight. They have a nice display downstairs. Uh, and so if any of you are teachers, uh, you might want to talk to them about the possibility of, uh, of friends uh, leading a, a field trip for, for your students. It's really a, a really nice service they provide. OK, so here's these brine shrimp cysts on the head of an eraser. I didn't count these. Maybe there's two or 300 on the head of the uh, eraser. And as I said, these hatch into a, this uh, nopuli. They're about a millimeter long. These eggs are about a quarter of a millimeter long, really tiny, as you can see. All right. And then uh, they, they, these grow up and go through the life cycle. But in the brine shrimp harvest industry, we short circuit that. And these eggs, a lot of them, not all of them, but they float on the surface of the lake. And they get into slicks like this under calm conditions. And here's a brine shrimp boat with a collection boot bloom floating down on the cysts. And we were out, actually, on this day, we were sampled. We were anchored, measuring through things throughout the water column. This raft of cysts came by. And then we see the boat coming, drifting at us. And they're waving madly, move, move, get out of the way. Because they had been, they, they stay on a, a slick like this for several hours until they can corral it and then pump it up onto the boat, right? And so then they'll put it in bags like this, take it back to their, their uh, uh, factories, clean it up, because there's a lot of stuff that isn't bright. And there's bird feathers and all sorts of things in there. Clean it up and then dry it out and package it and then sell, sell it to uh, aquaculture industry. Uh, and largely for prawns. And so in Southeast Asia and in South America, the baby prawns need a highly nutritious food. And these nopuli that hatch out are really nutritious. Right? Uh, but also certain types of fish, the larval fish, uh, do really well on these uh, juvenile shrimp that, that hatch out. All right, we've, we've done an interesting project uh, with funding from the Division of Water Quality, something called paleo, or kind of ancient, limnology, all right? 
uh, and we analyzed the brine shrimp and some, also some metals. So what you do in paleolimnology is drop some sort of device down to the bottom of the lake and take a core. This is a really short core. This is about 15 centimeters long, you know, about that long. And we take it up and then we slice it up. In this case, we sliced it in a half centimeter, quarter inch type thick layers and analyzed each layer. So these sediments at the surface were recently deposited, maybe in the last 10 or 15 years. And the further you go down the core, the older those sediments are. The US Geological Survey, out of using a different type of device, has taken a core that's 100 meters long. right? And in that 100 meter core represents about 100,000 years of history of what's been falling down to the bottom of the Great Salt Lake. So it's a pretty cool technique. We're in this core, we're, like, we're just looking at a few hundred years. One of the things we did, it was actually kind of a side project, but we thought it would be cool, is to take those slices and we used brine and got the brine shrimp cysts that were deposited in the sediments. And we floated those out and then we treated them and we put them in this, uh, 28 gram per liter salt, which is roughly about what little less than seawater, and see saw what hatched out, all right, after three or four days, all right. And here's the here's the data, and he, this is going from the, on this axis here of the graph. This is about the year 2000, 1950, 1900, 1850, 1800, 1750, and so forth. So this is deeper and deeper down in the core. We use a technique called lead 210 dating to figure out how old those sediments were that we're working with. And here's how many Artemia cysts we found in the core. So up towards the surface, we had about 1,000 per gram, all right? Grams a centimeter, a cubic centimeter, right? And it decreased quite a lot, but way down at the bottom, we were still getting 10, 20 cysts per, per uh, per, uh, per gram, of, gram of, of, of sediment down there, all right? And here's what hatched, okay? So here's the percent hatch of Artemia cysts. Up towards the top, we were getting uh, 40 to 60% of the cysts that we found hatched out, all right? And as we went further and further down, we got much lower percentages hatching but way down here, about cysts that we estimate to be about 200, deposited there 260 years ago, they hatched out. And one of my colleagues, who happens to be a dean in one of the colleges here, he commented, older than Brigham Young. <laughs> so these cysts were deposited a very long time ago. We also use those cores and what we were really funded for were to look at metal pollution and this process of eutrophication. Uh, but we can look a little bit at the metal pollution, and there's reason to think that there's, we should have metal potentials for metal pollution. We have refineries that discharge down the Northwest oil drain that flows out into Farmington Bay. And then we have <coughs> refineries. We have the Kennecott refinery now, but 50, 100 years ago, there were lots of refineries in the Salt Lake Valley. And the, the metals would come up in the smoke and then can be deposited on the nearby land, okay? Or in our case, in the Great Salt Lake, right? So we've got mercury, selenium, arsenic, copper, lead, zinc, on and on. So here's, fortunately, Utah has kept really great records of the production of different types of metals, whether it's lead or gold or silver. In this case, I graphed the copper production for, and uh, it was zero up until the very start of the 1900s, and then copper production went way up, and we're up here at uh, 300, th uh, what do we have? Uh, 300,000 metric tons of copper being produced each year, all right? From, from the Kennecott, largely from uh, our, our pit mine there, all right? Here's the copper in the sediments, same sort of graph we were looking at before. So we're year 2000 up here, down here we're down, uh, down to year 1800. And this is the copper, the micrograms of copper per gram of dried sediment that we got out of the lake bottom, all right? And you can see up to 
uh, close to the 1900s, we just had background levels. That was what's naturally weathering out of, out of uh, the terrestrial environment. And then with onset of mining, we jump up and we have really high levels and peaked in the oh, 1940s, 1950s, something like that, and then it's dropping down, all right? What happened in the 60s and 70s? What kind of legislation occurred? Those of you that are old enough. I see a few of you that are old enough. What happened? What piece of legislation might have caused this? Somebody said the Clean Water Act, and that certainly could, could have helped and contributed, but it's more likely another act. EPA was established, Clean Air Act, right? So we had to start cleaning up what was coming out of the smokestacks, and in this case, out of the smokestacks of the refinery. And if you look up here, right in here, copper production dropped to zero. Kennecott closed down for a year, redid their whole processing, and put on much better scrubbers on, the, on their smokestacks so that we didn't have as much acids, we didn't have as many metals going up the smokestack and then coming down into the lake. So things are getting better, right? This is a good news story, environmental legislation that actually worked, right? However, if we look at these levels, the levels are still pretty high. These are, this dotted line here is the uh, value for fresh waters, not for the Great Salt Lake. So we have different organisms, we have different chemistries, so we're not sure how applicable this is. But if these were fresh water, the, this level here would be the probable effect concentration. It's probable we're going to have some effects on the aquatic organisms in there. Right? And we're still above that, although it's headed down. And uh, so it's high enough levels that we're definitely concerned about it, and the Division of Water Quality is doing a lot more studies on it. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> things are going certainly in the right direction. This kind of looks at all of the metals. Here we're just looking at copper, and I graphed this in a different way, and I graphed a pollution index. So this is the fraction of the pre-industrial concentration. So at its worst, shown by the blue here, Copper was 44 times higher than those background concentrations before any mining started, right? And then with the Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, or whatever things, in the case of lead, we just stopped mining lead because we used up all the stocks. But now we're down 18 times what background natural concentrations were. And you can look at all of the metals, and for almost all of them, it's a really good news story. Concentrations have decreased a lot since the 50s and 1960. The, exce up, the exception are selenium and arsenic, which are either stable or some of our other data makes it look like maybe they're even increasing. So there's concern about, about those contaminants. But it, overall, pretty good news story. But the really biggest problem for the Great Salt Lake, we have eutrophication, we have high metal levels that we need to be concerned about. But the biggest problem for the Great Salt Lake in the long term is that we're drying it up, All right? So one of my colleagues out on the shore of Gilbert Bay, and you can see a lot of exposed lake shore. So here's some data that's been put together and now taken by the US Geological Survey. It goes back to the time of the Mormon pioneers, and here's the south arm elevation uh, in, uh, in, that's a lie, in feet, okay? Um, and so from 18, uh, 1850, roughly, up to a little over 2000, year 2000 in this graph. And we have lots of ups and downs, right? And when I came, Linda and I came to the valley in 1983, the lake was headed up and flooding was the problem. There were you know, water running through the streets of Salt Lake City and we were worried about the lake flooding everything out. But if you take all, but that was short lived, you can see that there. And if you take it as a whole and you do what we call a regression analysis, this is a downward trend, right? And where is that trend going to lead us? Right? 
You could look at that data, and I, I think many people have looked at that plot. It's a common one we, in, our, in the researchers that, and the managers that utilize the lake. We're looking at this plot all the time and say, well, yeah, it goes up, it goes down, but is, is there any real trend there? Right? Well, Craig Miller in the Utah Division of Water Resources has gone back and he's done an analysis of the water diversions that have been water that's diverted from the Bear River, from the Weber River, taken out and used primarily in agriculture, but also for industry, also for uh, water in our taps. Okay, we're taking water out of the Logan River, the, the spring water anyway, that would go in the Logan River. We're all utilizing it or we're putting it on our lawns. And he analyzed that and said, okay, what's the effect? What if we hadn't taken the water out? Okay, what would the level of the Great Salt Lake be? And with, with that modeling exercise, that's the red line there, all right? And currently, we're about, the lake, because of the water diversions, at least according to his model, is about 11 feet lower than it would be if we hadn't been diverting water for 150 years, all right? And that converts that 11 feet because the lake is so shallow. Remember, it's only 35 deep, feet deep and it's bowl shaped. That's about a 50% decrease in the volume of the lake. The amount of salts in the lake are fixed. They're not leaving, no river's leaving the, the lake. And so we've about double, we've halved the amount of water and we've doubled the amount of salts overall. All right. So we're having a really big effect on, on the lake. And probably most of you know there's discussions going on now how to develop another 20% of Bear River water for agriculture, for industry, for all the uses we put that fresh water to, right? But what's, what's to become of the Great Salt Lake if we keep doing that? This, is, this desiccation of salt lakes is not just a problem of the Great Salt Lake, it's a problem worldwide. Salt lakes usually are ly lying in arid areas, so Fresh water is precious. You know, populations are growing. We want more agriculture. Uh, we often want to do our lawns. Uh, so it's a problem worldwide. So I had an opportunity last year to go visit uh, a sister lake, if you will, Lake Urmea in Iran. And it's amazingly similar to the Great Salt Lake. And that's why we, some of us were invited there to a conference on saving Lake Urmea because these are both on the same scale, and if, if you look quickly at them, you would think it was two pictures of the same lake, all right? Same orientation, uh, very close in the same size, very close in the same depth. It, lake Urmea is even divided by a causeway, in their, their case, an automobile causeway that goes across it, right? When Lake Urmea was healthy, it has a lot of bird populations. It had flamingos, it had pelicans, you know, similar. We don't have the flamingos, but uh, other than that, very similar sort of ecosystem, all right? Here's Lake Urmea now, well, no, here's Lake Urmea in 1995, completely full. Here it is today. There's been a huge amount of agricultural development and water diversions, dams, uh, canal systems. Water's not getting into the lake. And here's, here's what's left of the lake right now. They've pretty much dried up the whole thing. It's salty as well, and so this is all hypersaline. It's saturated. At the really high salt levels, you lose brine shrimp, you lose brine flies, you lose the birds because they don't have anything to feed on. Right? So the new president of Iran, or fellow new, Hassan Rouhani, when he campaigned um, and, and got elected, he campaigned that he would save Lake Urmea, right? So there's a lot of efforts going forward. They're trying to institute different irrigation practices, things like drip, drip irrigation that uses less water, plant different crops that don't demand as much water, right? But I think they're too late, right? They may be able to put some dikes in where the rivers come in and save little remnants of Lake Urmea. But some of you may know the story of the Aral Sea, even bigger system in Central Asia. The Soviets in the 60s and 70s diverted water from the rivers there, dried up the Aral Sea, right? 
It used to be a huge fishing industry because it wasn't that salty. Now all those fishing ships are lying on their sides on a dry lake bed, right? And that's pretty much the situation. Here's an old ship took a picture of on, on the lake bed of, of Lake Ermea, all right? So they, they waited too long, right? So I think the question for us, you know, so how much do we value the Great Salt Lake? How much do we value water getting into the Great Salt Lake over what we value it for agriculture, for watering our lawns, okay? Is it worth saving? We have time to save the Great Salt Lake. It's, it's got its problems right now, and it's 50% the volume it probably should be, right? But it's a pretty healthy ecosystem, sporting millions of birds, a lot of, lot of industries. So in the long term, you know, we're going to have up, we're going to have wet cycles and dry cycles, and that's things going to bounce around. But if we continue to divert more and more water from the Great Salt Lake, it's going to look like Lake Ermea or the Aral Sea. All right, I don't want to end on a sour note, so I'll show you some pretty pictures from some different photographers. This is Charles Ubel, is located down in the Great Salt Lake or in Salt Lake City, he takes some spectacular photos. If you've never visited Antelope Island, uh, you need to get out there. It's a spectacular place to visit the lake itself and look at brine shrimp and so forth, but the wildlife is spectacular as well. All right, White Rock Bay, uh, a, a view from a short hike you can do. Uh, here's another Charles Dubel shot um, boating uh, out on, I think, near Antelope Island. These are. Uh, stromatolites in the foreground here. The wildlife is spectacular. Bear River Bay are all, all sorts of refuges around the lake. Uh, you can see spectacular uh, waters and colors and so forth if you go up on into Gunnison Bay. And this is one of my favorites taken. I wish I had taken this one, but this is a friend of mine, Bob Grutzmacher, a local photographer. And this is the spiral jetty here, which is up in Gunnison Bay and a very, very nice sunset. And this sort of sets up because one of the talks down the line in a, in a couple months will be about the art that's associated with the Great Salt Lake, of which the spiral jetty is really prominent. So with that, I think I'll uh, finish up and take any questions you might have. Say that again? In Lake Ermea? Yeah, were, were there brine shrimp in Lake Ermea? There was. They had a healthy population, not any longer. It's too salty. They can't survive at those uh, super high salinities. They had brine flies as well. Those are gone. Yeah, so the question is, are, are legislators uh, concerned about this? I, you know, I'm sure it varies from legislator to legislator, and it's not on everybody's radar. And it wasn't really until I saw that modeling effort that uh, Miller had done, I, I would have been inclined to, well, that's just bouncing around. We've got a wet cycle, a dry cycle. But when you do the analysis that way, it's clearly a different story. So, uh, you know, I've been working on the lake for 30 years, and when I first came, I, I wound up doing a project on the limnology, remember that word, right? Limnology of the lake, uh, because there was hardly anything published on it. I mean, there was some old stuff, but there wasn't much being done at all, so I just did a descriptive study of the lake. But in the 30 years I've been here, there's been a whole lot more in interest. So the Division of Water Quality, Forestry, Fire, and State Lands, uh, U.S. Geological Survey, all these different agencies. We have task force. Uh, we have a group that reports to the legislature. And the probably, I don't know if it happened this week. If not, it'll be happen next week. They just let uh, Forestry, Fire, and State Lands let out of, I think it's right, $200,000, $250,000 uh, grant to uh, some consulting firm to do a comprehensive study of the waters of the Great Salt Lake Basin 
with the focus being on, well, not solely on the Great Salt Lake, but certainly the Great Salt Lake is part of the story. So we're going to look, you know, where is the water out going to, you know, how much, you know, comes out of the southern part of the basin, how is it being used, can we uh, improve and u utilize it more, more wisely. So it's, it's on everybody's radar, but so is that fresh water on, you know, all everybody's radar. And so it's been in the paper in the last two, three weeks about the development more of the Bear River. You know, where are we going to put another, another dam? And you talk to a lot of people, you know, a person who cuts my hair said, well, if the water gets to the Great Salt Lake, it's wasted, all right? We can't utilize it anymore. And that's been the dominant view for, you know, 150 years almost. Wasted if it gets to the Great Salt Lake, because you, you can't drink it, it's too salty, you can't irrigate with it, except for small exceptions, it's no good, you know, it's too salty for fish, so what's it good for? Well, hopefully I've convinced you it's good for some things anyway. And so I think the view is changing. We're going in the right direction. Whether we can change it fast enough to get ahead of the water development desires of, you know, well, every, you know, most people in the Western United States. It's not just, just Utah. Yeah. Wait, wait. I'm, I'm old and have bad ears. Go ahead. When the lake's down, are the population of the birds lower? Uh, that's a great question. And I don't know the answer. I study a lot of things in the Great Salt Lake, uh, but I don't really study the birds. I like to take pictures of them, and occasionally I do a few counts. Frank Howell? <laughs> We've got a bird person somewhere in the audience. Do you know if anybody's correlated the bird densities with the uh, number of, uh, with the lake level? <laughs> okay, so there's a, Audubon has a table out here so you can visit them. So, you know, there's still a lot of birds, so we're not in really dire straits by any means. But as it gets smaller and smaller, it gets uh, saltier and saltier. And I just had an undergraduate study finish up a study and show that the saltier the water got, the slower the brine shrimp grew. Right? And when you got above about 225 grams per liter, the brine shrimp weren't surviving at all. Brine flies little, did a little better, but they didn't look like they'd be able to reproduce. So one of the barriers will be the amount of salt. Right? The absolute amount of area is probably not limiting. So that's an excellent question. And I think we're OK in terms of the amount of area. The other part of the 2.3 million birds that visit, a lot of those are associated with the freshwater wetlands, like the Bear River Refuge, if you've been down there. That's mostly freshwater, right? Sir, um, is it really that they are, they are using uh, Salt Lake water uh, with the process of reverse osmosis to use the water for the Kinnikuth mining company? Yeah, so the question is, are the, are the Great Salt Lake waters being used? Uh, and there's a process where you can go called reverse osmosis. You force water through a membrane, and you get fresh water out one side, and the salts stay behind. Kennecott's not utilizing the Great Salt Lake water for that. They do. Kennecott polluted with one of their ponds out in the Salt Lake Valley. They polluted the groundwater in, in the Salt Lake Valley with high salinity, high mercury, high sulfur water. And when that was realized, they were required to clean that up. And so what the, to, what, well, you don't really clean it up, but you keep it from spreading by pumping the, water, the groundwater in that area up to the surface. And they're putting that water through reverse osmosis program and then using it on the housing development on their lands over, over towards their mine. So that process is being used, but it's not utilizing Great Salt Lake water per se. So let's just take one more question and then we'll stop um, formally asking questions in here. Let people who want to go out in the halls and look at things look. And then if you have more questions, come down. So one last question. Yeah. Yeah, the question is what percentage does the Bear River contribute? 
it's about 70% of the river inflows comes out of the bear. Right? So that so if you develop the bear a lot more, you're gonna have you know substantial impact on the lake. Why don't we let people clear out a little bit, but uh, happy to stay down here and answer other questions. And let's say thanks to Wayne. <laughs>